It's another edition of Orange and Blue today with Cecil Amy and Andrew Mason. And NFL scouts and NFL coaches have chimed in on some of these potential Broncos quarterbacks. But first, Mace, we got to tell everyone where we're getting some of this information from. And it's from Dane Brugler's Beast from The Athletic. You have to get it. It's the best drive, draft guide that's available to the public. And I personally believe Dane Brugler is the best draft analyst in the country. And it's extremely thorough as far mm -hmm. as the... Uh, the bios that are done particularly on the top players, but goes very deep. But this, these are always interesting. And I would say, unlike the unnamed scout quotes that we disseminated a few weeks ago from Bob McGinn, these I think have some, have a little bit more heft to them. And I would say also are focused more on building up rather than tearing down. Right, right. Now, we can talk about the Caleb Williams quote, but we're talking about Broncos potential quarterbacks. And well, if you want me to bring up Caleb, I will, Mace, but I don't think he's any sort of option for Denver because Chicago's going to take him. He's going to be a Chicago Bear. Okay. Because, like, uh, we'll see. I mean, I'll declare it the way you, you would declare Vance Joseph's going to be fired. Caleb Williams is going to be a Chicago Bear. That's there you go. And you're going to be pretty well right. done. Yeah. Two weeks from tonight, man. Two weeks from tonight is NFL draft. But let's get to this. And I always print out the beast and my printer goes nuts and working overtime when getting it. But this is you on print it out. Name. How old school of you? Yeah. And I'll also bind it as well. Like Sandy would used to do. Anyway, um, this one's on Drake May from an NFL scout. And I think it's very interesting. Let's get to it. it says, quote, considering May's family success, I expected a cocky kid, but he's a real grounded and humble kid. This golly G stuff isn't an act. He'll need time before he's ready to lead an NFL room, but he'll get there. When that NFL scout says that, you read it in the Beast, Mace. What do you think? I think to myself that, okay, it, it, what we saw from Drake May at the Combine press conference, you know, he, you know, very, he very kind of rushed in his answers. You could tell there was a little bit of nervousness there. Uh, that's something that will probably go away with maturity and i think that's what we'll see from him over time that in terms of him growing as a person and he's what 22 years old i mean how many of us were finished products at at 22 that it's going to take maybe a little bit of time for him to command that locker room but that he has the attributes and he has the personality to do it he also has the personality i think to really bridge some gaps even in competitive situations just look at the fact that uh, Sam Howell, uh, his former teammate in North Carolina, now with the Seattle Seahawks, they're very close friends. And mm -hmm. they're very close friends in spite of Sam Howell maybe holding up Drake May a little bit, right? And that could have become a really interesting competitive situation. I think that says a lot about uh, about Drake May. And also one of the things that I've, I've heard from you know, people around, the North, around North Carolina, what you hear, uh, whispers and uh, stuff, you hear that he is very one of those types of players who is trying to get, you know, get everyone in the locker room. He is, a, the, he is not a quarterback who kind of operates on an island. He tries to interact with everybody in the locker right. room, which I think is something that will serve him well as he matures into a leader of a team. When I read that and I went back to our experience around Drake May at the Combine, I thought of authentic. You know, I'm yeah. more of an alpha guy. I want my quarterback to be more presidential, although that term doesn't mean what it used to. Like, I, I want that type of personality. But I was reminded this morning by Sigmund Bloom, a dear friend, of course, that said Eli Manning was like that. You know, we've had these quarterbacks who are just kind of, you know, Andrew Luck. He's kind of boring, right? We all love Andrew Luck. Generational talent, Andrew Luck. Eli Manning did have that fire and competitive spirit. So I think there's a difference between the golly G, you know, Drake may that's who he is, but also he's a fiery competitor that loves to win. Metaphorically speaking, being an NFL quarterback and being in that crucible, that pressure packed environment, that's going to put some hair on your chest. <laughs> okay. It's part yeah. of the growing process, though. I mean, you're gonna, you're going to take some arrows, and you're going to be wounded. But you might be stronger in the spots where you're wounded. You know, you know this the old cliche about, oh, yeah, you break a bone, but it heals back stronger. Uh, there, you know, on the road to success for most NFL quarterbacks, you know, someone like C.J. Stroud stepping right in right away and flourishing. 
That's kind of the exception. On the road to success, usually there are some bumps. I think what it tells me is that maybe the arc of Drake May, once he gets in there, it may look more like Trevor Lawrence than C.J. Stroud, whereas you know Trevor Lawrence, there were definitely some ups and downs. I think the coaching, obviously, his first year with Urban Meyer did him no favors, but there's, you know, there have been peaks and valleys to him over the course of his career, even though I think we're sitting here going into year four. And it's clear that Trevor Lawrence is a franchise type quarterback and Jacksonville should certainly get a long term deal done with him. If Drake may succeed, I think the arc may look like that. We saw Trevor Lawrence start from day one. Now, we've talked to enough people, and I, I tend to disagree with this, May, so I guess we could chop it up about May in this aspect if you'd like. I think he can go week one. I think he can start day one, uh, just like I said about Bo Nix. Like, get him out there. What are you waiting for? With May, I feel similarly. But you and I have talked to enough people that say, and, and great people, Chad Ryder, Eric Edholm, and all these guys are like, you know, you could give him a year. And if you're Minnesota, who really loves Drake May, and they get him instead of Denver, you've got that luxury of Sam Darnold. Denver doesn't have that. So if the Broncos land Drake May, what do you want, Jarrett Stidham for a month? like, Or Drake May week one? It sounds like, for me, I'd rather prefer week one. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing about the Broncos is – Jarrett Stidham would have to be far more than he's shown to be able to fend off the chorus of people calling for Drake May to get out there. The question you always ask with a young quarterback is, when do we put him out there to where it doesn't do damage to his long-term outlook? Because there's a long list of quarterbacks who went out there too soon and it stunted their growth potential. So that, I think, is the question with Drake May. I'd say it's probably also a question with J.J. McCarthy as well, even though conceptually there are more things from that Michigan offense that he did that will translate than for Drake May coming from North Carolina to the NFL. Drake May has better tools, athleticism, He's got the driver in his bag that J.J. McCarthy doesn't quite have, but J.J. has the concepts that translate better for a chance to get out there more quickly. So that's that's something you have to weigh as well. I get what you're saying. Hey, start finding out about Drake May, but at the same time, you got to play the long game. And if you look at a quarterback, see where he is at the end of training camp and say, okay, if we put him out there too soon, we're not doing him any favors, then you have to ride with Stidham if the situation is Denver. Yeah, especially if you're giving up draft assets to move up for a Drake May. You got to do what's best for May. And if that, mm -hmm. if you deem that's sitting, then that's sitting. We might find out in training camp, right? It might be a Matt Flynn, Russell Wilson situation where you're like, the, the kid's just better. The kid's yes. just better. Um, Jaden Daniels, I'm going to bring this up briefly, although the commanders are going to take Jaden Daniels at two. I'm very fairly convinced of that. Um, Adam Peters loves him. Also, Adam Peters after Jared Wiley on uh, the Chargers, both working out mm -hmm. Jared Wiley. And and uh, Dane Brugler had Wiley as like his number four tight end. I thought I was high on Jared Wiley. Uh, <laughs> Dane really, really loves him. So anyway, on Jaden Daniels, super quick from Brian Kelly says his work in the offseason was unbelievable. We used to cut out how long players could stay in the building, but had to change our protocols and give players unlimited access because Jaden basically lived there. <laughs> now, he is Dane Brugler's number three quarterback. He's number one in my heart. Uh, I, I love that. They had to change what they do to allow players in the building because Jaden basically lived at the facility. Yeah. Now, uh, I wonder if he was getting any classwork done if he was living at the facility. You still have right. to stay, you still have to stay eligible, right? Right. But right. he did. So he's, that certainly happened at LSU. So that... I think says a lot because one of the things you are looking for on the mental side, it's not just the quick processor, the quick ability to ingest information. It is the willingness to put in the time to do that because this is a job that once you get to July and go to the end of the season. So that's up to, now with the Super Bowl, that's six and a half, seven months that you're basically 
even though there's an off day on Tuesday, you're basically working seven days a week aside from that one week respite you get at the bye. You're working seven days a week, and as a quarterback, you're generally going from 6.30 in the morning to 11 p.m. at night. It's a long haul. It's another aspect to why being an NFL quarterback, it's so hard to find the people to do that because of how many boxes you have to check, including a voracious appetite for the job. Yep. You can't like it. You've got to love it. And only if you love it, are you willing to put in that level of time that is required to succeed when you see that kind of note from Brian Kelly regarding Jaden Daniels, that's the sort of thing it tells you that he's going to be willing to put in the work. Yep. And you know what grinds my gears, Mace, is when people say, well, it wasn't that at Arizona State. Oh, yeah. Guys grow. Guys change. Bo Nix. Oh, it wasn't that at Auburn. Well, yeah, he's changed. He's grown. Even Michael Penix, right? At Indiana, he is always hurt and reportedly rumored not to ever be in the weight room. And then in Washington, he has two healthy seasons. So it's like guys can change and improve. I mean, what if Joe Burrow had been drafted based on what he did at Ohio State? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, imagine that. Cincinnati wouldn't have a franchise quarterback. But there you go. I mean, we've sit, we're sitting here now. We've talked about Drake May and Jaden Daniels. And what we've talked about is growth capacity. And that's part of what you're considering in – this equation and part of what makes it so difficult in terms of draft evaluation is that you are trying to project not only to what it looks like on the field, but what this person looks like in terms of all the stuff that goes into leadership, ingesting information. You're trying to see what that part looks like two or three years from now. It's, you know, believe me, if somebody had had this thing, th this quarterback, secret sauce figured out they'd be the most in demand uh, executive or coach in the NFL, which is why it's very interesting when Sean Payton gets up there at the combine and says, he feels like that they could avoid the mistakes that other teams make. And that I, that's a bold statement. That's one that I think we're going to come back to over time, uh, mm -hmm. regardless of what happens here. Yeah. They're not good at it. Fortunately we are in terms of quarterback development. All right. I like the confidence, but man alive, that is Ooh. bordering on arrogance. That's got some onions. <laughs> that's got some huevos. Yes. That's for sure. Let's talk about JJ McCarthy. Cause you talk about, you know, growth and development in a young quarterback. He didn't do much in Michigan. Okay. Well get this from an NFL scout about JJ McCarthy before mm -hmm. he signed, he was telling other Michigan recruits that if they wanted to party and chase girls, go somewhere else. His class was going to be the one that restored Michigan to have that mentality, then actually go achieve it, he's different. Now, I make no bones about it with J.J. McCarthy. I love his personality. I love that he uses the Holy Trinity, thoughts, emotions, and actions. Because you can think about it. It doesn't make it happen. You can feel something. It doesn't make it happen. You must implement action into your plan in life and in football to make what you want happen, happen. And McCarthy manifested what he said. They restored Michigan. They want it all. And he is different. Thoughts, emotions, actions. T E A T. <laughs> Drinking his tea. You want some tea? Yeah, I like it. Yes, I like it, man. But yeah, that statement there. Now that's interesting because you do wonder. The only negative I'll say on that is: is he going to be in fifth gear a little bit too much to wear? the rest of his teammates might kind of struggle to reach that level. This is another thing. Um, you've, you've got to kind of sometimes bridge the gaps in a locker room because maybe you're an A worker, but not everybody else is an A worker. You're going to have some Bs. You're even maybe even going to have some Cs that have talent, but maybe they don't have the same kind of drive. Now, that being said, when there is success behind it, so if McCarthy blossoms, then that sort of work ethic and that sort of demanding atmosphere, that will attract others who can embrace that. Think, and I'm not comparing J.J. McCarthy to Peyton Manning, 
But think of how when Peyton Manning's with the Broncos, he was already in year 15 by the time he got to Denver. So what he wanted was well-established. And very much you figured out which guys were Peyton's guys, which ones were all in and which ones couldn't quite handle it. I mean, let's face it, a very good example of a player who could not handle it was the second round pick in 2014 in whom the Broncos had a lot of hopes. And that was Cody Latimer. Mm -hmm. But that didn't mesh at all. I mean, famously recall Peyton Manning yelling uh, at Cody Latimer during a game in Indianapolis, yelling at Donald Brown during a game. Right. Right. During the yeah. play, I think he yelled like, damn it, Donald. He did. It was picked up by the on-field mic. It's, it's, <laughs> and you could, it was a home game. So the crowd was quiet mm -hmm. at the snap. And oh, you, you hear very clearly, damn it, Donald. <laughs> 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 I love it. And the mm -hmm. more we talk about JJ McCarthy, Mace, and we're two weeks away from the draft. I, I mean, it just, how could Sean not love him? I mean, love him, not like him. Yeah. Everybody should like him. How could Sean not love him? Just being around him the way we have just briefly around McCarthy at the combine, but being around Sean as much as we are like, dude, sounds like a love story. Yeah, but is it going to be a happy love story or a sad love story? There are a lot of love stories. There's a lot of stories of unrequited love. Oh. It's one of the great themes running through literature and music and film. Pretty much all, even like uh, paintings, like pretty much all forms of art. A powerful thing is unrequited love. Right. Being, you know, or loving from afar, which if you can't get J.J. McCarthy, you might have. We were talking about it yesterday with Sean Payton in 2017 wanting Patrick Mahomes. And the Chiefs jumped the Saints to get that number 10 overall pick in 2017. And Mahomes went to Kansas City. How might that have changed things for the Saints? How might that have changed things for the Broncos not having to see Patrick Mahomes twice right. a year? Right. Right. The moral of the story is that if if Sean Payton loves J.J. McCarthy and believes that he can get the results that he's hoping for, there probably is almost no price too great. If he loves McCarthy and is willing to stake his legacy on him, three. I mean, I hate to say this, but like three, three first round picks and three second round picks. I mean. If you love the guy, you believe in him, you might as well put all your all your chips in the middle of the table. Yeah. When you're as confident, I won't say arrogant, as Sean Payton, you would yeah. do that. And May says, Eric Edholm talked to us yesterday on OBT2. It's like, you have Mahomes regret because the one time he wasn't bold, he missed out on the best quarterback in modern football history. Yeah. The one time. The one time. I mean... If you look back on it, if the Saints had given up a first round pick in 2018 to move up one spot, everyone would have been like, whoa, how would we view that today? Mm -hmm. Genius be viewed Genius. Like, yeah. oh my God. Mickey Loomis you went is from, a genius. Yeah, it would be like, you went from Drew Brees to Patrick Mahomes. I'll actually say this also, and it's another what if. Maybe this is a what if for the offseason. Sean Payton is still the New Orleans Saints coach, isn't he? Oh, yeah. yeah. He gets and he homes. probably has a couple more Super Bowls. Yeah. Drew Brees might have gone somewhere else to end, of his, end his career. Mm -hmm. Because they might have nudged him to the door in 2018 to make way for oh, Mahomes. Yeah. Yep, yep. Been like the Alex. Maybe Smith Drew. Day. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Another. Oh, we'll, we'll come back to this on the Drew Brees if, lines up we, with Elway. Yeah, Drew Brees is a Denver Bronco in 2018. Yeah, because Jack that's, Elway that's loved my what if. Drew Brees. Remember yep. when we mm -hmm. talked to Elway as his first GM at the, at the combine, there was a small group yeah. of us. I got to talk to John because he didn't talk publicly. And he talked about how his father, Jack Elway and him watched Drew Brees and loved him at Purdue. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yep. give me chills. Look at that. Chills on a Thursday, two Dang. weeks from the draft. Um, we got a couple minutes left, Mace. I got to throw in the, the Bo Nix stuff super quick and we'll get to Levi Wallace as well. Um, but with the Bo Nix, uh, this one from, Oregon head coach Dan Lanning he sits in a coaching meetings, operates completely different level than anyone I've ever been around. Plus, I want everyone to 
subscribe to Mike Tanier's Substack. How many times do I say that? Because I sent you some uh, passes of 15 plus air yards. This shows yeah. how aggressive a guy is. Bo Nix, 56, almost 57%, 1,420 yards, 14 touchdowns, three interceptions. I'm not a Bo Nix apologist or defender necessarily, but we have to get the conversation correct about Bo Nix, especially when it's Bo Nix with Sean Payton. It would work. It would fit. Maybe the ceiling isn't that of Jaden or Drake May or J.J. McCarthy, but it would fit and it would work. And the advanced data shows more about Bo Nix than people saying all he does is throw screens. Yeah, it's very interesting to kind of to, to look at that, look at those numbers. Look at you look at that, you look at his accuracy and how much he can generate under pressure as well. These are these are check marks in Bo Nix's favor. And the other thing is you always say it's about fit. If if Sean Payton decides Bo Nix is a fit and picks him at number 12, that's fine. I expect I expect the Broncos would get value out of that. Whoever the Broncos draft at quarterback, if they draft a quarterback in round one, I expect will do reasonably well. I expect they will not be a bust. Right, right. Mm. How to take a drink. Anyway, let's talk about Levi Wallace, uh, veteran corner, visiting with the Broncos on Friday. And we can maybe hash it up a little bit more um, tomorrow if you want, Mace. But it is some news today. I believe Jordan Schultz had it. Um, that Levi Wallace, the Broncos are looking for corners. We've talked about it, mostly about the late round guys they would show interest in. Although we did talk about the Kuiper mock with Terry and Arnold going to them at 12. Uh, but the interest at corner, I mean, it can't be more obvious. Uh, Levi Wallace signing again, we go back to the Riley Moss thing. Okay. Maybe Levi Wallace is signed. Maybe not. We'll see if he can impress the Broncos on Friday. Yeah. Uh, Levi Wallace last year for uh, for Pittsburgh, Coin and Pro Football Focus, a 100.9 uh, passer rating allowed uh, on 72 times that he was targeted by opposing quarterbacks. That was goosed by, unfortunately, a rough season in terms of giving up touchdowns for Levi Wallace, credited with seven touchdowns allowed. This would be a signing that I think may be more like a Fabian Moreau type of signing where you'd like the young guy to play. And if he's not ready to play, then you put in the veteran. Like if they brought in Levi Wallace, I would think, I think this is more of an insurance policy, just like Sam Mustafer at center last week is an insurance policy in case either Luke Wattenberg or Alex Forsyth don't seize the job then you've got somebody who's done it. If Riley Moss can't step forward, then in Levi Wallace, you have somebody who has started and played in a reasonable level. We're not talking about a star. Someone can go out there and contribute, though. That's what I think. That's what I think this is. And when you talk about those corners that they have brought in, now they did interview Terry and Arnold over at the Combine, and they did have Jimmy Leonard over at Cooper DeGene's Pro Day. But the ones that they brought in for top 30 visits, these are day three type of corners. So that's where you're looking at uh, taking t- taking another shot. Cor- corner is one of those positions where you probably are well advised to use a draft pick, not necessarily an early pick, but use a draft pick on a corner every year, assuming that you've got at least seven, eight picks. I think to me it's like it's corner, it's offensive line. I would also throw in a QB because I believe, you know, I believe that you take as many shots on, on QB, you throw as many darts as possible because if if there's no room for them and they succeed, you can get get a nice surplus out of the deal. But mm-hmm. that's what I think if Levi Wallace comes to the Broncos, that's what I think the situation is. He's an insurance policy in case Riley Moss or Damari Mathis is still in the room, doesn't blossom. He is Andrew Mason. You follow him on all the socials at Mace Denver. I'm at Cecil Lammy. That's a wrap for today's edition of Orange and Blue today. We appreciate all of your love and support on YouTube. But Mace, how can they help us out on YouTube? Like. Comment. Share. Subscribe. Hit that notification bell. So that you never, never miss, miss a... Uh... Vid. vid that's pretty that's good right that's pretty it good is. today that's good it times up better uh when it's on youtube than when we're streaming it air but anyway uh yeah obt it's a bfd thanks for watching everyone he's mace i'm cease we are orange and blue today
Stay tuned. And would you please stay frosty?